Okay, so reconstruction of skull base um, clival defects. Okay, so the area that um, we're focused on, okay, so for the non um, ENT um, surgeon and non rhinologist, this is looking at a sagittal view of the sphenoid sinus, um, behind which and below postro uh, inferiorly sits um, the upper, middle, and lower third clivus. And this is where. Um, the tumours, the chordoma, the chondrosarcomas that we're talking about are focused on. So starting at the top of the screen here, um, in terms of reconstruction, you can see how the orientation of the skull base changes. So as we go from the top of the screen to the bottom, the orientation changes from horizontal to pretty much vertical. Okay, so different factors come into play when reconstructing clival defects. So from being concerned about your graft just slipping off uh, to pulling away and not sort of sitting uh, adequately within that recess that you've created um, between the paraclival carotid arteries. Mm -hmm. So for this um, sort of tumour, okay, so the upper two images uh, show a chordoma, so midline tumour. Uh, the lower two images, the chondrosarcoma. So these are relatively midline, and so you can get away with um, a relatively limited um, uh, nasoceptal flap type reconstruction to close off or seal off this type of defect. But when you start to um, work out laterally, so behind paraclival and below petrous. Um, carotid artery, when you've drilled away the root of the pterygoid, um, when you've divided uh, a vidian nerve on one side, um, and really starting to work out um, to one side or the other. So this is showing clival recess, this is showing paraclival carotid artery. Um, and when you start to work out to one side or the other, um, then uh, you start to have to think about um, modified reconstruction techniques, so larger flaps uh, augmented with other uh, layers uh, to help you to seal off any potential CSF fistula. Um, so preoperatively uh, in the images above uh, and then you can see in the postoperative images below, so a larger defect, so potentially exposing uh, more uh, postrolaterally uh, in terms of dura and the risk of um, CSF leak and fistula increases once you start to work out one side or the other. So really, for example, with a tumour that goes out towards uh, the left side and behind the left paraclival carotid and uh, um, out towards the left jugular foramen, it's that circled area of bone, um, not just the rostrum in the midline, not just the clival recess, in the midline, but you're actually working off in, in quite a far sort of lateral direction. And so uh, your usual sort of reconstruction size of flap isn't adequate. Um, and so you're looking at modifying techniques. So this uh, uh, you know, pretty substantial um, chondrosarcoma. Um, and if I just show you the video above, that's post resection. Um, so looking out towards the left jugular foramen, um, with that pulsation, um, but really that that sort of defect gives you a different sort of reconstructive challenge than the, the, the more straightforward sort of midline um, tumours in the initial slide. So what should you be thinking about? Um, the size uh, of the defect, um, which is pretty obvious, um, but uh, once you start to um, address um, larger tumours, the size of the defect very quickly um, increases. The site of the defect, as I've alluded to already, so um, in terms of orientation and thinking about gravitational forces, and also your, your reconstruction sort of sliding off or not making contact with um, uh, the defect bed. Also having a think about whether this is the first operation, um, so our oncology colleagues have presented uh, a number of instances where patients have had three, four, five operations, and so your reconstruction options start to diminish um, the more operations uh, a patient's had. Um, radiotherapy, so post radiotherapy and salvage surgery causes uh, its own problems in terms of reconstruction. I'll talk a little bit about that. And also, what uh, autologous materials are available and what's been used in previous 
um, surgical interventions. So I've alluded to the site of the defect um, already. So as you move from anterior to posterior, you can see how the direction of the skull base changes. Um, and what's important is uh, in the sort of clival area is reconstruction over critical structures such as the cavernous sinus and uh, the internal carotid artery. So making sure that those critical structures are covered. Um, so if this is a first operation, uh, a patient may have had prior sinonasal surgery uh, or uh, an extensive biopsy. And again, uh, nearby materials that you may have used um, could have been destroyed uh, or used in that first reconstruction. So I'm thinking about the posterior septum here. I'm thinking about inferior turbinates. Are they available? Um, can, you, can you sort of harvest from both sides of the nose um, in terms of a flap from one side and an inferior turbinate from the other to sort of augment uh, some sort of reconstruction? The principle is... Uh, of a tight seal, okay, so fluid not getting out and air and uh, bacteria not going the other way, otherwise there's a risk of uh, CSF leak, uh, CSF rhinorrhea, a risk of meningitis and a risk of cerebral abscess, okay, so really important um, to try to keep your momentum going as well, um, so to ensure that uh, uh, you try to go for as long as possible without um, uh, uh, having complications such as CSF fistulas that can compromise uh, your uh, um, confidence in carrying out these procedures on a regular basis. So your best options for reconstruction are always going to be autologous materials. Okay, Least uh, favourable are synthetic materials because of a risk of infection and because of a risk of extrusion. Okay, So your available tissues for clival defect reconstruction are going to be your go-to materials such as fascia lata. Paul's alluded to the use of fat um, as uh, an additional layer. Muscle also very useful so if you're harvesting fascia lata from um, a patient's thigh then uh, other materials that are readily available from that site are fat and muscle. Okay so you could contemplate harvesting everything that you need at one uh, one uh, donor site uh, morbidity and then having a think about your pedicled vascularized flap so our go-to flap is an extended uh, nasoceptal flap based uh, based on the posterior septal uh, branch of the sphenopalatine artery and then for some of those more challenging cases so post radiotherapy or multiply operated on patients um, we've used um, go-to flaps such as the temporoparietal um, fascial flap tunnelled uh, via the infratemporal fossa uh, and free flap uh, in uh, an instance or two the radial forearm uh, free flap uh, again tunnelled um, in that pre-vertebral space to uh, the uh, um, site uh, of surgery. Our go-to autographed materials are fascia and fascia lata particularly um, but in our practice we're almost exclusively use uh, allograft, so donated or cadaveric uh, fascia lata which has gone through a tutor gen process and been irradiated so inc in, uh, incidents of infection or rejection uh, are uh, almost non-existent. We have a fairly large uh, series of these patients now um, and uh, for us it reduces donor site morbidity. Um, there are challenges if you work in other sites across Europe or Asia particularly and the Middle East uh, the material may or may not be available um, but we found that uh, it really does uh, make our surgery less complicated because there's less donor site morbidity involved with um, patient management and what you can see in this photograph is uh, an inset uh, so an inlay of um, this uh, material, so tutoplast cadaveric fascia lata, which looks and feels uh, identical to fascia lata once it's been rehydrated, and we use a thin layer of tissue or tissue glue uh, to create that watertight seal. And what we found in instances where we have had to go back to re explore and uh, plug uh, tiny fistulas is that the material does really sort of integrate into, into um, the uh, recipient site. <coughs> 
So this is uh, this donated fasciolata graft being secured with uh, some droplets of tissue just around the margin. We use sparse amounts of uh, tissue. We don't like to build up a thick layer that absorbs and uh, then our onlay flap could drop off. But again, you can see that it's a very nice material to work with. Our go-to flaps, um, so local flaps, autograft flaps for um, a primary operation or a secondary operation where the, where the flaps haven't been compromised previously are uh, uh, an extended uh, posterior um, uh, septal nasal flap and an inferior turbinate flap. I'll just talk to you a little bit about those. So the extended flap goes down onto the floor of the nose and even underneath the inferior turbinate. Uh, I've also harvested all the tissue off a turbinate for, the, for larger defects. Um, we use a monopolar um, cautery to delineate uh, the margins of the flap, so just underneath the uh, sphenoid ostium on the right side here, and then coming forwards, uh, medial to the middle turbinate, um, coming forwards, uh, often underneath the olfactory fibres, um, and then once uh, I get to the head of the middle turbinate, then taking that flap further up towards uh, the vault of the nose, and then anteriorly. Um, so you can see that flap, um, so the upper uh, incision with uh, the monopolar diathermy linking up to um, the incision that comes along the floor of the nose anterior to the incisor canal and then dissecting in that submucopericondrial plane. Okay, so very important, that's an avascular plane. And then once that plane has been dissected, okay, so working along the floor of the nose, working posteriorly, Okay, you can see really you've got uh, a very nice um, vascularized, healthy piece of tissue uh, to reconstruct uh, your clival defect. And in fact, that's quite a versatile graph that we use for a number of reconstructions. So this is on the right side. So imagine that the tumor was extending behind and below the left internal carotid artery. Uh, then as Carl and Paul have shown, um, so on this side, I do uh, an endoscopic medial maxillectomy. So take out the middle turbinate. Uh, we'd augment that with a canine fossa puncture and then the flap that's stored in the nasopharynx for this part of the surgery is then stored in the maxillary sinus or the or the ethmoid sinus because we're going to be drilling out um, the bone that sits in the vicinity of that pedicle so being very careful we store it uh, in, the, uh, in the antrum. So Rake has already showed you what uh, a pedicle um, looks like uh, again so that's quite important so post-operative appearance of uh, what a what a pedicle on a nasoceptal flap looks like. Um, I like turbinate flaps, okay, so I use a middle turbinate flap a lot um, for um, adjacent lateral lamellar cribriform plate or ethmoid roof uh, defect. An inferior turbinate flap is also very versatile when you're struggling for tissue or you're concerned about the edges of your nasoceptal flap. It's based on the, the posterior lateral nasal artery of the nose, so another branch of the sphenopalatine artery uh, and, and internal maxillary artery, very versatile flap. And you can see just behind, so just above the eustachian tube on the image on the right, that's where that flap needs to get to. So it doesn't need to go very far. Um, so whilst you may not be able to use it to close a clival defect completely, it's certainly very useful for when you're sort of flip flapping or, or using flaps, um, a nasoceptal flap for, ex for example, and an inferior turbinate flap to augment each other to, to close up a fairly substantial defect. The temporoparietal fascial flap is uh, a flap that uh, Paul and Carl's group uh, described many years ago, um, so in the 2007s, around about that sort of time. Uh, but this is a great salvage sort of flap for when you have no material inside the nose for local rotational flaps. Okay, so um, this is based on the deep and superficial temporal vessels. Um, so although um, Paul described this uh, via a hemicoronal incision, we actually use a bicoronal incision because it allows us to extend the flap then across the midline um, for more tissue. Um, it's based on muscle and uh, temporalis fascia, so you can get a good sort of chunk of uh, tissue um, past um, through so infrazygomatic infratemporal um, and there's a little bit of preparation that needs to go on inside the nose so again an endoscopic medial maxillectomy 
the back wall of the maxillary sinus is removed with exposure of the infratemporal fossa. And then with a blunt instrument, usually a large sort of clip, something like that, you can just make a little tunnel and then pass your uh, temporoparietal fascial flap through. And then the distance from, from, from there, that penetration point to the clival um, defect, the recipient distance isn't very great. Okay, so the important point here is just to make sure that your, your pedicle doesn't rotate as you, in, as you insert the flap. So the sort of situation that you may find this useful is when, you, when you've reconstructed with a nasoceptal flap, uh, but there's been failure, uh, because of radiation and microvascular uh, compromise or where there have been multiple previous operations and a local flap isn't available. So this is a really nice healthy piece of tissue um, to use. We've also had two on instances use uh, a free flap um, for reconstruction um, and that's just because of say damage to uh, pericranium or radiation or some other compromising uh, factor so we've had to look elsewhere for tissue so a radial forearm free flap again is a nice myofascial free flap uh, and those vessels are plumbed into local vessels then in the neck uh, so the superior thyroid the facial vessels and the plane there really then is a pre-vertebral plane uh, so retromaxillary um, retropharyngeal okay so behind the mucosa and then penetrating um, into uh, the uh, um, hypopharyngeal area so that you can then implant your uh, graft uh, at the uh, recipient site. So again, just very important that the pedicle isn't twisted. Um, it's monitored. We usually do this sort of surgery in conjunction with our uh, free flap surgeon. So in Manchester, that's our maxillofacial um, surgeons that we work very closely with uh, and uh, uh, this has been very successful on the occasions that we've had to use this technique. Raker showed a very nice schematic uh, of um, reconstruction and supporting uh, the repair. So support is, it's critical, but it's, it's quite easy to overdo it. Okay, so um, one of the messages I think that we'd like to sort of get across is that the temptation is to put layer after layer after layer of, of of graft firstly so multi-layer closure um, and then to support and support and support but actually um, I, I think that probably causes detriment on occasions uh, you can compress the pedicle inadvertently uh, and cause problems with graft viability so once uh, once we've used our inlay with fasciolata whether that's allograft or autograft then we use uh, the nasoceptal flap overlay and then surgical stamps around the margins of the reconstruction, which we think um, promotes uh, an inflammatory response. Uh, so that helps uh, the flap to integrate and to scar down. And then we, uh, we onlay on the right here, the image on the right with um, saline soaked spongy stand. So again, that forms another layer. So that once we pack with uh, this is ribbon gauze with Bactroban nasal ointment, so mupirocin nasal ointment. So that supports the graft, and it's important that you sort of try to tuck that into the clival recess and then build up your support as you come from below upwards. Okay, and then we'll put a, a layer of uh, nasopore, which is another absorbable type of dressing over the top. We tend to leave this sort of pack in situ for about three weeks after surgery, any earlier we feel there's a risk of plucking your graft off. Controversial area um, is lumbar drainage. And again, I think you'll hear different perspectives. I'm sure Carl will talk about this in his case uh, later. Uh, we feel that it's not mandatory and we certainly don't use lumbar drainage um, as a matter of routine. We tend to reserve uh, lumbar drainage for our early post-operative leaks. Um, we found that leakage is greater with intradural disease, and that's pretty obvious because the dura is open or where the dura has been lacerated, not so with uh, extradural um, disease. Um, and so we feel that lumbar drainage isn't, uh, isn't necessary for all cases. And certainly but many complications related to uh, a lumbar drain, um, which you will all be uh, aware of. So in summary, 
um, just to bring this uh, presentation to a close, um, we, we perform a multi-layer closure. Okay, we think that's quite important. So an inlay and an onlay. We feel that less is more. The temptation is to keep layering and layering. Uh, we use an allograft inlay material. Um, so the fasciolata, which behaves very much like uh, autologous fasciolata. We use an onlay with a pedicled nasoceptal flap if available. Uh, very important to ensure uh, that the flap isn't involved with the uh, pathology. So we tend to use the contralateral side. And when you're supporting, it's important to be aware of gravitational forces. Otherwise, your flap will just drop off. And also think about using a combination of flaps if you're concerned about margins uh, and leaving gaps potentially.